anybody here would like to come up and join me, you know you're more than welcome. But we'll open up with the uh, 219. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And if you would, let's stand together again.
Everybody have a seat for a Come on, buddy. Thank you for that. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for that. Thank you. Good to see everybody today. It's a beautiful day. It's always a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, but the weather is great today. It was a beautiful day yesterday. Of course, we know that school has started for some districts and for others. They'll be starting this week. So uh, always keep our kids and all the school personnel uh, in your thoughts. Before we have communion, I would like to read from the book of John. From John chapter 6. Verses 32 through 35. John chapter 6, 32 through 35. Jesus said to the people, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. represents the true bread that came down from heaven. Remember Jesus as we eat together. This drink represents the blood that Jesus shed for the sins of the world. Remember Him as we drink together. Before we take up our offering, I'm going to read once again from the book of John, from John chapter 12, verses 44 through 46. John 12, 44 through 46. And these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Amen.
don't have any other requests, I'm going to read from the book of Hebrews this morning. From Hebrews chapter chapter 4 I, think, I thought for a second there my Bible didn't have Hebrews in it anymore <laughs> but I did, uh, I did find it and these are wonderful verses I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 about Jesus, the great high priest. That's who he is. Since we have a great high priest, that being Jesus, who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. The great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, tempted in all ways, just like us. The human side, was tempted, and the divine side never gave in to that temptation. He was sinless. And once again, I like to point out these paintings, these portraits. You have Jesus, the Savior. You have Jesus, the man, the carpenter. One and the same. Both doing their job, their earthly job, their earthly and divine job. Well, it's always good to be here with you, and we hope that you feel as we put on our bulletin, sometimes it's on the outside, sometimes it's on the inside, but we hope that you experience the presence. That's what we want you to experience here, the presence Well, here's a question for you. We'll open our message today. I don't have an outline in the bulletin. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But here's a question for you. We just spoke about professing our faith. We just read some scripture relative to that. So the question is, what is faith without works? Just think about that for a second. What is faith without works? Now, if you don't know the answer to that question, maybe we can answer that question today because sometimes there's a, I won't say a disagreement, uh, but in what that means. Faith and works and how do they go together? Uh, do we have to have both if we only have one or the other? So maybe we can answer that. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse one says, now faith, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is believing in God. And is believing in God without being able to verify His existence by human standards. And we always want to do that, don't we? We're human. We want some proof. We want tangible proof of something. But we don't necessarily see God even though we see what God has done in the world or in the universe, the creator of this unending universe. We can see that. But we can't necessarily put our hands on it and verify that God did that. So we are sure of it. We have faith in it. And we're certain in it, but we don't see God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, 
For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. So that helps us a little bit already, doesn't it? Grace and faith doesn't come from us or our human friends and family. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. And we don't get that by the works that we do. We don't earn ourselves a place with God. And as Scripture said, so no one can boast. Paul, who wrote many of the books of the Bible, Paul says that a saving faith comes from accepting God's grace, not by your works. So there again, <clears throat> faith comes from accepting God's grace, accept it as that gift is given to us, not by what we do, not by our many works. Now, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 24, it says, a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. So if you read those, you're going to wait a minute. There seems to be some disagreement between Paul and James, but there's not. Because James says a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. So maybe we need to talk about that just a little bit, but they're not disagreeing. When Paul talks about being saved by faith and not by works, he's talking about the works of the law. The law. The Jewish law. And Jewish law claimed that salvation was the result of being obedient to a strict set of laws. Man-made laws. I think 614 of them. Uh, who knows? Maybe more. The laws made by man. Paul is saying that by following every one of those laws, every single thing, down to the smallest detail, that does not bring you faith. You can do all those works, go through them one by one, keep everything just as you should be within the rules. That does not bring you faith. That's something different. Paul also was saying that by our efforts alone, we can't find salvation. So once again, we need something more. Both of them tell us that. James does and Paul and we need something more in our life. But it is by believing in the invisible God, the God that we can't see but we know is there, that does bring us our salvation. But James is talking about works that come after our faith, after we believe in God. What are we going to do after we say we believe in God? After we believe in Jesus. Should that make a difference in our lives now in the works that we do? We have our faith, but what will we do with our works? So James is talking about, about a faith that expresses that faith in works. A faith that is active. Because there's one thing as we know to say, I'll do something, or I believe in something, but then it's another thing to actually do it, isn't it? To really put your hands and feet to work responding to that faith. And we know that there's so much work to be done in the world. We can't talk it away, can we? We just can't simply talk away. I mean, we all know that prayer is a wonderful thing and we can communicate with the great Creator anytime. But if we can do more, we need to express it in our works, not just in what we say. And James is also saying that our works and their faith, one and the same, should be displayed in the way that we treat people. The way that we treat people. And we will find some good advice when it comes to keeping the, as Scripture puts it, the royal law found in Scripture. That royal law being love your neighbor as yourself. That is the royal law in Scripture. James chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that if we keep this law, this royal law about loving our neighbor as ourselves, we are, as it says, 
doing right. We're doing the right thing by treating others as our neighbor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in that same book, the book of James, it goes on to talk about favoritism. It goes on to talk about mercy and faith and deeds and different things. And it's a short book, so if you get the chance, just read the book of James sometime. But loving our neighbor, Jesus says, is one of the days that we're going to, one of the ways we're going to be judged on Judgment Day. The way we treat each other. The way we treat that stranger that enters our life. That's one of the ways we're going to be judged ourselves. And so, if that is the case, then we need to see what Jesus says about treating others. So, if you have your Bible handy or your pew Bible, I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 25, or you can just sit back and listen as I read these verses. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. So here's a little bit about what Jesus says about how we should treat others. Matthew 25, 31 through 40. And these are the words of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. There it is. How do we treat other people? How do we act toward our neighbors? James chapter 2, once again referring to the book of James, says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Now we touched on that. Favoritism, don't show favoritism. Favoritism can become a companion of something that none of us likes. Favoritism can many times become a companion of prejudice. So we have to be careful. Favoritism and prejudice sometimes can go together. And then those two things together can reveal something. Pride. Pride. And God, it says in the Bible, God opposes who? The proud. Now there's a good kind of being taking pride in what you do. We know that. So there's the, there's the difference. Uh, in the definition <laughs> in being proud of a job we, well done. But in that proud, I'm better than you sense, God opposes that. That's very clear that God opposes that. In the book of 1 Peter it says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. Just the opposite of being proud and boastful, right? Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another toward your brothers and sisters, toward your neighbors, because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's pretty clear. That's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Humility towards others. I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not saying me personally, but we are not better than anyone else. Humility. And when we think that we're better than someone else, it's very clear God says, I oppose that. 
When you think that you are so much better, when we think that we're better than other people because we think we're more intelligent than other people, or that I'm wearing nicer clothes than somebody else has on, I've got a better car, i got a bigger house. God opposes us when we think in this manner. We're thankful for all those things. We're thankful if we do have some intelligence and education. We were thankful for that. We're thankful that we might be able to wear nicer clothes than someone else. We should be thankful that we have a, a good car to get us around places or a house to live in. Thankful for those things. Don't boast about those things. You can take pride, once again, in having those things. You've earned it. You've worked hard for these things. But that doesn't make us better than someone on the street. And it says when we lack humility, or when we don't help someone because we feel they don't deserve our help. And sometimes we make that judgment, don't we? Don't. We can say that person, they don't deserve it. I'm not going to help them. Once again, it's very clear that God opposes us when we think in that manner. So James is essentially telling us don't look down on people. Don't insult people with our prejudice. Don't judge someone worthy or not worthy of our help. Instead, let us love them as He loves us. Let His compassion and His care for people who need that compassion and care come through us. Once again, they're not going to see the hand of God reach down from the heavens and do something for them most likely. It's, it's you. It's you. It's us. The hands and the feet of God. We're here to do that. So let God use your hands, your feet, your voice to comfort people, to love people, to love our neighbors. And who does the Bible say is our neighbor? All people. All people on this planet are our neighbors. And Jesus made that clear to us. Jesus didn't show favorites, did He? Jesus ate and hung out with the worst of the worst. People that hated the tax collectors. Well, he hung out with some of them. Political radicals. He didn't care about politicians. He was going to hang out with whoever he needed to hang out with. He didn't care about the poor and the lame. He hung out with those people. He took the time to help the people that other people judged unworthy. Jesus took the time to take care of them. <coughs> Jesus said that the last would be first. The poor would be blessed that the servants would become the leaders, and that the simple were the wise. Those people of low position would one day have a seat of honor. That's right here. So living as a follower of Jesus means loving the unlovable, if we deem them that way. Loving the unlovable. And we love them even when it's unpopular to love them, when it's inconvenient, to love them, or when it's uncomfortable to love them. We are to love them. We need to look for opportunities, <clears throat> as it says in the Bible, to demonstrate our faith, if we can, in our actions, our works. It's a faith that works, going together. Those opportunities are there every day, aren't they? Maybe the person that just does need you to say something kind to them. Maybe it's the person that that elderly person or someone who's not capable of doing things around their house, their lawn, whatever it is, you can just lend them a hand. The opportunities are endless. Maybe it's the homeless person that you'll see on the street today that needs a meal. Who am I to judge that person if I give them a dollar what they're going to do with it? Who am I to judge that person? Find ways to love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes the person you help has changed, and sometimes you are the one that has changed. As it says on the church side, if some of you read that on this side, lyrics from a song, 1969, he ain't heavy, he's my brother, he's my neighbor, I'll have that. All people. Are our neighbors. We're going to have an 
invitation hymn this morning, and maybe you've not professed your faith in Jesus, and maybe today's the day you want to do that. And once you profess your faith, then go into the world and show those good works. Well, our invitation hymn this morning will be number 342, called Rock of Ages. We're going to stand together one more time. what we talked about today. We profess our faith in word. And now let us go forth and show our faith and works in deeds. So our closing hymn this morning will be number 503. It says, Jesus came into my heart. But join me in a closing prayer before we sing that great hymn. Jesus, we thank you again for letting us be here. 2,000 years have come and gone. And we still praise you the same way. Let us take what we learned here today and share that love with someone else. In his name we all pray. Amen. Thank you.